hip hop music bouncy oh, kid. Yeah. My love for hip hop it came from NWA, Eze. Those are the first people I start up. Joke remote. We call this a joke for a moment, Bounty Killer. <laughs> when you say something nobody ever heard, that's a Joper moment. Joper Winfrey. Joper Winfrey. Your first love for hip hop come NWA Easy E. Yeah. Easy E was the first one I really got caught up with, and then came Snoop Dogg. Then it was Snoop Dogg and Tupac, and then I started listening to KRS One. Mm. KRS One, Snoop and KRS One and WNA and then Big Small came, the Jamaican background guy. When Big Small came, it was all over. I'm a total rap fan. <laughs> the Snoop Dogg, the Big Small and the Easy He and the Slick Rick and the KRS One, those are the ones who got me hooked and rap. And then I saw Super Cat and Shabba ranking together with the guys. And I said, what? I, I like that idea. So when I got the break and I came to New York, it was my partner named Johnny Wonder now. He's a white guy who grew up in Brooklyn. So he know the whole fusion of the hip hop and everything. And he said, it was a good idea for us to come using that hip hop dancer. Right? It's called the culture of me. So it was Johnny Wonder who came up with these ideas of me doing the rap tracks with the regular stuff. And from there, I started out with the Fujis and the Buster Rhyme and the Jaru, the Damager, and the Mob Deep, and I never stopped. Let me tell you something about the killer. You have a timeless style of forever flow. You're the only guy, well, one of the only guys who have hit records to stay relevant era after era after era after era after era. What is the secret to this? Why you stick around and you on top of the game like you was in the 90s now? Well, I, I don't know exactly what I did to cause that because I don't do nothing specifically to keep relevant. What I would say I do to keep relevant is be real, be realistic. I don't say fictionary stupid things. I like to say things that we live, not just what me live, but what we live. So the reality of we live in these things keeps it alive. It's just like when I said, look into my eyes, tell me what you see, can you feel my pain? Am I your enemy? You got someone out here saying, Ooh. that's not my statement alone. That's a general statement. So you I'm know, like, Bounty Killer, sometimes the guys in the picture with us are the enemies. Yeah. And over time, you see them fade to black because these guys, the enemy, it's like with the enemy within. You say that, right? The other day, I'm looking on, on Instagram, and I know Khaled's going to kill me. But <laughs> I see your old friend, Tony Monteron, <laughs> talking crazy. <laughs> I mean, your bounty killer, man. Everybody know the wall up. What's wrong with this guy, Tony? This one of these guys, huh? I gave him all the tools he need to man over the world. And I don't know what's up. He's just not doing what he's supposed to do. He's doing that thing. But he's okay. But I was the one who introduced him to the world. Everybody knows that Tony Mataran got his whole break from Bounty Killer collaboration. Because he had talent. But I was the one who gave him the equipment and the tools to further his talent. And... I don't know what these have been problem with. This is crazy. This social media and hip hop too. Sometimes you see guys you always respect and they acting crazy on social media. You say to yourself, damn, what, yeah. what's wrong with these guys? Like, <laughs> I mean, all the time. And, you know, somebody we respect, you know, when you had a sound clash, you had a party. What is the dub besides a bounty killer dub? What is the dub that you heard? For the first time, and you said, oh, shit. Like, he bust that dub. Like, who, who? what is the dub that blew your mind besides a bounty killer dub that you hear at a class or a party and you just go, oh, my God, how they get that? Oh, well, most of the great dub plates it is really classics because we have a problem now. The younger generation, they can't do dub plates the real way because mm. dub plate... 
has to do with the feelings and emotion, and it has to do with a crazy vibe. Because a double plate is not a song. The first line has to be effective. You can't sing a double plate six, eight bars before the effect comes. As you say, the first word, so now go dead. Yeah, it's supposed to be very effective like a bullet. And this young generation, they don't do dub plates good. They see the dub like they're doing the stone guy a favor. Like, yeah, I'm just, I don't even want to open my mouth. Yeah. So when the dub play, don't bring no energy to the crowd. So most of the dubs that would move me today would be some classic dubs from a Bujo Bantan, a Capleton, a Mad Cobra, or a Cabo Rankin, or a Super Cat. Those type of dub, some half pint, some Reed Asburn. Those are the, the type of songs that would really get You know, me over here, me over here, me hearing stories about Wyclef Jean playing Michael Jackson dub plates. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> what, I mean, who's, who, who's the craziest? So you like, the, of course, the Bon Ton. You know, that's my family. That's yeah, my yeah. Brother. You know, Budja, you know. No, okay. when you play a Michael Jackson, that's a bragging rights. That's not really a killing song. Michael Jackson ain't going to talk about killer boy. Michael Jackson's going to sing about love. So it's a bragging rights. I can play a Michael Jackson and Dub, but a Michael Jackson and Dub can't kill no sound. Think about it. He ain't going to kill no sound. No. Nah, it's going to make you look like, yeah, you're on another level because you got these big hakauna you're playing, but what he's saying is not effective to kill a sound. You couldn't play Michael Jackson and kill Khalid. No. He's going to kill it with a bounty or a bounty or a capital time. And what More was it? What, what, <laughs> was it <laughs> what was it, Bounty Killer, about Khalid? Him go to Jamaica. He get his start in Jamaica. Why you say, I'm going to give this kid a chance. I'm going to do some dub plates for him. What did you see in DJ Khalid early? that you show him the love you show? Well, the vibe, Khalid has a special vibe. Khalid has a special aura. He's captivating. He's infectious. Khalid takes you over spiritually. He had that spiritual vibes. And then now, it's the first I met a Arab selector back in the days when we just hear about Khalid and all these crazy Arab people. We never know that there was an Arab who played dance or music. I've never met an Arab before. So when I met Khalid as an Arab who played dance or music, it was impressive for me. And then mm. he used to play on the radio. He was a disc jockey also. So the fact that he's a disc jockey he is more than just a selector in the club. And we need people on the radio. And then he's an Arab who loves dancehall and he loves Jamaican culture. He's different from the normal, typical Arab guy. You know, Bounty Killer, I have same phone for 20 years. I got him down as the Arab. His number is the Arab. <laughs> yes, yeah, so Khalid was a different person, man. And then now I find out that he's into sound clash. I realize he came to Jamaica to clash. So I never know he's clashing skill. I know that he's a good disc jockey and he plays. But when he came to Jamaica and he said he, he was going into the clash, I was like, yo, this is serious, but it's the right place for you to go and make it mark in Jamaica. So I gave him a few dubs and he went to the clash and he never won the clash, but he stands out. And that was all he needed to do. Just stand out more than all the others. And he did that about 1999. And from there, Jamaica people wanted more Khalid. And they like the Arab guy. You know, I see a lot of people take from the Jamaica culture. They make rhythms and songs and hits. But don't come back and embrace Jamaica the right yeah. way. True. How do you feel about this when you see people? Because everybody, nowadays, you know, everybody from everywhere got the Jamaican vibe, the Jamaican <laughs> melody, the Jamaican, but yeah. not Jamaican, and don't really go back to Jamaica, embrace Jamaica like them supposed to. What you say about this thing, Warlord? No, that's a serious problem we've been having over the years. That's why a lot of people like to call people culture vulture, as they are culture vultures. But we have people who show the love and the respect 
all the time. And it's not just people who get the benefit from Jamaica. People like you, Joey Crap. You never try to collaborate with a big song, that's why you like it. You just love the culture from a youth growing up in New York. That's right. And we embrace that. So Khalid was one of those persons. Khalid never used to think that, oh, Jamaica was going to make him big. And then Khalid got his break and he arrived. I never even know Khalid was a producer. So as I told you, you know, I started to power with Khalid you now, 98, 99, and I'm making the album 2002. That's when he did the intro for the album, the Ghetto Dictionary album. So he said he wanted to produce the track. So I never knew he was a producer at the time, but I know that he's into music and he's good at crazy ideas and innovative thoughts. So I said, all right, let me hear the beat. If the beat is on fleek, we good. Cause you my people, I don't care if you are a professional producer. You wanna produce, we gonna produce. So he gave me the beat and the beat was one whole throwback bad man beat. So I did a song with him. Test me if you can, or maybe. Why you go dead? Come me gone, them no lazy. I am warlock, so go and tell war lady. Let me come, come me gone, them are not lady. So that song was produced by Khalid on the album, and he did the intro. And from Let this, the relationship started to bloom, and then I started to come to Miami, and me and Khalid apart. And from this, so we become family. You know, every time I speak with Khaled about you, he tell me, Warlord, pull up in the newest vehicle. Truck, Benz, Lexus. The man love luxury. Fendi yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> what is it about that? How hard is it to get a, a car? What, what was the hardest car for you to import to Jamaica? Is it hard to get, like, one of those cars? Well, the first car I imported to Jamaica was an Acura TL. That was 1996. It wasn't that hard because, tell you what, only when the cars are like over 3,000 cc, it caused a certain amount of beauty. When the car is like 3.0 or under 3 liter, the duty is okay. It's normal duty. So they're going to bring it up big car like a Bentley or a Rolls Royce or those type of cars, then you gotta buy it. You gotta buy it at the dealer and then pay the government in Jamaica twice. So that, that's the only car I, I, I import at that time. And then in the 2000s, I import Range Rover. And what else I import? I, I, I buy all my vehicles in Jamaica now because I have to buy them three times. <laughs> You buy it over here, you got to pay for it three times. I can buy it over there, you got to pay the government three times in Jamaica. <laughs> buy it in Jamaica. I understand. Uh, Vibes Cartel, God bless Vibes Cartel. You introduce him to the world. Yes. Uh, yeah. Is there any hope of him getting out soon? Well, he's still having an appeal. The appeal is still going on. He's getting an appeal from an higher court overseas. So they are still in the whole process of appealing. Okay, yeah. so he, he, still, he, he still got a shot. But I know the system in Jamaica doesn't want to let out Vibes Cartel. So despite discrepancy in his case, or questionable things, they deliberately wanted to lock up Cartel. The system in Jamaica went after Cartel. So despite what... His case or the scenario was they wanted him. So if he's going to get any freedom, it's going to move from a higher court overseas, but not Jamaica system. They wanted caught him. They used him as an example. We're not, I, I can't say if he's innocent or he's not, but I can say, yes, he's guilty from what they told me in the case. And the affidavit, they, 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 there are a lot of discrepancies. But they are not a dead body, and they are only one, evidence. and then there are a lot of tampering with the evidence. It's questionable, so that's why people kept saying free vibes cartel. And so, what he, what what did he represent? He represented the youth. He represented he, getting money. He represented the street. He represented the youths. He represented the now generation. Mm -hmm. 
And so they were mad at that. Yeah, they were mad at that. And they have it like, oh, he's a bad influence. Yeah, and he has too much power and control over the culture. They tried it with me too. They tried to put me away too, but thank God they never had it against me. Yeah, what what was that like, man, when you hear uh, the Gaga man, Budja Bantan, is really land in Jamaica? That was like a super holiday. Yeah, that was a little. Your bounty killer. My yeah. only regret, I had a show the same day. Oh, you could uh, Connecticut. I wasn't there for the Bougie concert. That's my only regret. <laughs> I wish I was there. I'm seeing pictures of Shaggy in the crowd and yeah. Sean Burke and Khaled on that thing and Shine. And I was like, oh my God. Yeah. It was like a super holiday in Jamaica, yeah. huh? Holiday. That was our last great holiday until COVID came and spoiled it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you something, Bouncy Killer. Your top five, I ask everybody, your five, your top five rappers of all time, rappers of all time. My top five rappers. <laughs> well, as I told you, Snoop Dogg is the one who really make me like rap. NDA introduced me, but it was really Snoop Dogg. So it, my top five rapper would be like, Snoop Dogg, I would say Slick Rick is the king. But the rappers that brought me to rap is Snoop Dogg, Tupac, and Biggie Small. So my top five rappers Slick Rick, NWA, Tupac, Biggie Small, and Snoop. That's wow. Wow, you know it's crazy. Snoop Dogg called me last night, FaceTime. Yeah. You know, all I can say to Snoop is, I love you, Snoop. I love you. I love you. Uncle Snoop, yo. Uncle Snoop, he's the biggest artist in the world. Yeah. He's the big rapper. Cloud head. True. He's the, he's, the, he's the biggest living rapper today that five-year-old kids knows of. He transcends all the eras, like four generations now. There's nothing you can do when you see Snoop Dogg. He FaceTimed me yesterday. I said, Snoop, I love you, man. I just, I, what do you want me to do? I love you. You know, he tell Khaled, Boo in and Snoop Dogg tell us yesterday. They both said, fuck you guys. You guys in vacations. Send a plane over here, man. I want to come vacation too. <laughs> Bounty killer, I love you and I thank you for coming on the show. I Shout out it. to Sharon Bank. Could you tell us about the new album? Oh, well, I'm working on this new album. Well, it's 18 years since I last released an album. Doing The last album I released was the same one that Khalid did the intro, 2002. Get to Dictionary. It has been nominated for a Grammy. Great success and everything. But they canceled my visa 10 years ago. So that killed the whole vibes of me touring and making appearance overseas. So I kind of didn't lost the vibes of music. So I was just here holding my vibes with my family and just chilling. So it's Damien Jr. from Marley. Ron Marley, this brother. He's the one who really said I should do an album and he would exactly produce it. So Rohan Marley? Who, who said that? Junior Gang. That's Junior Gang. I want everybody in Jamaica to know Fat Joe got the worst patois in the world, and I feel comfortable using it when I talk to Bounty Killer, okay? Yeah, that's Damien Jr. Gang Marley. Rowan Marley. Jr. Gang Brown. Marley, yes. Yeah, so he's the one who encouraged me doing the album, and he would executive produce it. So that's why I'm working on the album now. So the album Man, that's a beautiful thing. Rowan Marley's on here. I yeah. can't wait to hear that album. It's going to be uh, a... It's going to be a double album, one like a reggae album and then one like a dancehall, raga style. Two yeah, we need some dancehall. We need... Yeah. So that's need, what... You first. know, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, what was it? Rihanna's birthday? Something. Rihanna's birthday or something. I love Super Cat. Khaled goes get Super Cat surprise. Yeah. Super Cat waiting downstairs. This is a fancy place. <laughs> Khaled got to send the white Bentley. You know, everything white for Super Cat. Khaled tells me in the table, he's scared. He says, yo, man, Super Cat getting tired of waiting, man. 
I gotta go downstairs and see the No, he can't get scared. He can't get scared. He's getting so, scared. I go with Khaled downstairs. I start telling jokes. Me and Super Cat on the floor laughing. On the <laughs> ah, we on the floor. We had the best time in the world. You know, I love that era. I love that era. Um, it is is the Wolf Foundation. They yeah, man, the era of Shaba, uh, Mad Cobra, yeah. uh, Super Cat, mm -hmm. uh, Capleton. You name them. Tisla. You know, this a Barrington Levy. Whoa. You getting deep now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, these are like, you know, you know, I knew, uh, I don't know if you know the first artist, and Rohan Molly don't kill me. The first artist that ever crossed over from Jamaica to the U.S. was called uh, Big Ute. He was, oh, he was a little guy with the dreads all the way yeah. to the floor. Yeah. I used to hang out with him in New York. Boo, you introduced me to him one time. I used to walk the street with him. The man never talked. He go like this to the people. Yeah. Yeah, Big Ute, he's one of the founders, man. He's one yeah, of the he's first. one of the founders. Well, we right, my brother. DJs I've been listening to from the days of you, Roy, Rankin, Trevor, and Big U, they are the three first DJs in Jamaica that we was, was little boys. Yes, so Man. Big U is one of my influences in reggae. He's one well, but to get to love his music. In this legendary interview right here, Bounty, because I know nobody gets to interview you, I must shout out Jabba and Bobby Condis. Yeah. Who keep so, reggae uh, music alive they for are 30, the 40 uh, years. New York. They are the In New York, they keep reggae music alive. Yeah. Straight up. Bobby, Bobby and Jabba, they are founders in the breaking of the reggae hip hop world fusion and keeping the wood Jamaican culture alive in New York. And remember, I must say Shinehead because he was yeah. the first guy I, I seen busting reggae and hip hop yeah. in New York. Shine yeah. it. Shine it. They had a lot to do with the fusion of the dance hall and the reggae stuff with the hip hop. Yeah. They are the pioneers. That's crazy. Thank you, Bounty Killer. God bless you for coming on here with me. You're always welcome, my Respect, brother. Respect, my brother. We love you, Bounty Killer. I love you. People are yeah. there. Buh, 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 buh. You don't know who I know. You don't know who I know. Bounty killer from Kingston, Jamaica. Boy, I'll bust your bumbo clad head, you know. Selassie Arastafara, I see. Jack Rule, you know. Oh, man, the bounty killer in the motherfucking house. And I'm not calling the horse. Let your darkest moments bring your most clarity. Put God first in good and bad times. Love God at all times. Peace, y'all. We the biggest in the game.